now, once we've picked the candidates, once we've hired them, what's the next step? Well, we need to see how they're doing. Once a candidate has been with our company or been with our government organization for so long, we have to do performance appraisals or performance assessments or measurements. And so this is going to have to tie back to our job analysis and the work demands. Performance analysis should not be about how nice are they or how much of a team player they are or how much they fit in with the work culture, because that can be very discriminatory. We have to instead tie into how it fits with their job analysis. Is the work they're performing meeting the demands as listed in their job description? And we have to find measurable ways to do this. Can we measure how many customers they've worked with? Can we measure how many projects they've delivered on? Can we measure how many times they've completed a certain task? And that is something more measurable and less discriminatory we can use. Now, some of the outcomes of these performance appraisals may require dismissal and remediation. And this is the idea that if you're going to appraise someone's performance, you have to be ready to take steps to address the employees that are struggling and maybe not turning out the way you hoped. It would be very bad to do a performance appraisal, find out somebody's awful at their job and not take any action, because then it's going to decrease the buy-in on the appraisals for the rest of the team and everyone who's a bit more struggling with that employee who's not carrying up their end. And so with the performance appraisals, we have to have causes and outcomes. And it's the idea that if somebody's not doing well, we offer them help. If somebody really went through a hard personal time and they couldn't commit to the job, trying to find a way that we can find them to fit in. Or if they're really struggling for other reasons in the task, maybe shuffling their workload or finding what skills we can train in them so they can perform better or finding some avenue of remediation, helping to give them a focus plan that will lead them to success. In other case situations, we're not desiring to do that. Instead, we've identified that we're investing further in that employee is not going to pay off and we need to dismiss them. And so industrial psychology helps to offer some guidelines on how to do that in an equitable way and offering a way to do, to do this dismissal properly. Now on the flip side of things, if the performance appraisal acknowledges and discovers that some employees are really doing more than their fair share and they're really shining stars, again, we shouldn't sit on that because then people are gonna become disenchanted with the performance appraisal. So instead, we need to recognize when people do a good job. And recognition shouldn't just be a email with a smiley face. It really needs to be something a bit more than that, whether it's an appreciation lunch or whether it's an appreciation certificate or employee of the month award, it really is important at retaining good employees. Of course, if promotion is possible, that's even better. If you can boost someone's salary or give them a more swanky job title, then that can help to retain employees as well. So performance appraisal is about keeping a company healthy. It's about reducing the risks of retaining problematic employees and increasing and retaining the really high status, high productivity employees so the company becomes stronger. And the final step in this industrial organization we're going to talk about is not just forming good employees, but forming good leaders. And historically, there's been a lot of different flavors of leadership, and these can kind of be clustered into two categories. We're going to call these Theory X and Theory Y, as they've been historically known. So in Theory X, this is the type of leader or boss or supervisor who believes workers are lazy. They can't be trusted and they need to be constantly supervised and you need to intimidate them and use authority. This is the idea that you have to use punch cards to time in and time out. It's not about bookkeeping. It's not about doing payroll accurately. It's about keeping people on the clock and making sure you know exactly where they are. This is the idea that you believe in transactional leadership. It's the idea that if you give rewards and punishments to your employees, it's only so you get something back. You're not friends with your employees, you're their supervisor, you don't become friends at work, and you're only there to help them in so much that you can gain. So you can see with Theory X, this is gonna to lead to a more hostile work environment. This is going to lead to employees not really feeling like they can go to their boss, feeling like maybe they have to team up on their boss. And it's going to lead to a lack of autonomy, a lack of freedom, and it's going to be really dehumanizing. But this is something that's been used for a long time on factory floors or in hospital settings or if it's in education. And it's the idea we can't trust people. This is very different from theory why. And this is the idea that the boss or the supervisor believes that workers will work because they like to work and it provides them with inner satisfaction and that you can trust people to work on their own if you give them enough support, that you don't have to hover over them. This is a boss that's more focused on mentorship and believes it's not just about using the company to build themselves up, but a good boss 
actually helps to make their supervisees or their trainees to flourish. So this is the idea that they're more of a transformational leader rather than a transactional leader. They're just not trying to, it's not a business transaction now. They want to help grow and strengthen their team. These leaders tend to be a lot more considerate, charismatic, and inspiring. And they seem to humanize and really bring out the best in their team. So these are the ones that are going to be more trusting and allowing you not to use stamp cards, just everybody come in. If you come in a couple minutes late, you know that it's your responsibility to make up the hours. And they don't have to watch you too closely. It's the idea that they're a lot more trusting when you have to work from home, for instance, and you don't have to have your cameras on all the time. And so these two types of leadership still exist today, and we definitely know there's outcomes associated with both. And that's certainly not everything with industrial psychology, but that's a real quick tip of the iceberg. Next, we're going to jump over to a very much related area of organizational psychology.